Uh, we would like now to address the theme on aggregator platform development and use. Uh, there will be use cases and users cases uh, on the maritime API marketplaces, uh, which forces shaping the API marketplaces today and tomorrow and the opportunities that software developers pursue can pursue with this. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Edwin Abrahami, uh, Managing Director of Nextport International. Uh, Edwin is a supply chain professional turned innovator who has been serving international energy and chemical markets for 17 years. Um, before joining Nextport International in 2021, he held commercial logistics and operational roles at OPAC, and he was involved in various supply chain integration programs. He's passionate about the Dyson and connecting the vast and at times slow moving maritime port community. At Nextport Asia Pacific, he supports stakeholders in their journey to securely share data and create more efficient and sustainable supply chains for the future. Uh, experts joining Edwin are Ang Cheng Kiat, head group of uh, IT uh, PSA International, Sa Sagun Gar, head of engineering and podcast, uh, Flores Wilmin, co founder and managing director on board, Brett Spedin, APAC lead, Azure Digital Application Innovation at Microsoft. Microsoft. Uh, I will pass the floor over to, to Edwin. Um, Edwin, please, uh, my guest, continue. Thank you very much, Enrique, and thank all of you for dialing into this session today themed maritime API marketplaces and use cases. Uh, the coming hour, we will explore success drivers of such marketplaces and the opportunities and challenges it will bring to application development in that space. Uh, with me, as Enrique already kind of shared, are uh, four co-speakers and together we will share use cases and views from our respective uh, vantage points. Now, before diving into the good stuff, I would like to give our co-speakers an opportunity to uh, briefly introduce themselves. So they, uh, you know, a bit who they are, and you heard a lot about me already, so I can skip my own presentation. Uh, handing over to uh, Ang Cheng Kiat uh, for the first uh, intro. Take it away. Who may need to unmute. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Edwin. A very good afternoon to all. So it's my pleasure to be here today at the Singapore Maritime uh, Week. So just a short this, uh, introduction of myself. Okay, I head up the overall uh, responsibility for IT for PSA group of company globally. I, I'm responsible for the PSA IT franchise and synergy across all the PSA uh, business entity. Uh, that include the IT talent development, charting the IT information strategy, IT governance, development of the uh, uh, general uh, digitized solution for operation excellence, the digitization of the pop community, cybersecurity, resiliency, and cloud enabled initiative. So I also spearheaded the realization of a global IT delivery organization with alignment to business strategy and agility in driving IT solution. So Group IT actually uh, under PSA serve as a process excellent enabler for PSA business entity by leveraging on and developing cutting edge technology to establish PSA as a global champion in industry. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brett, uh, Brett Spedding from Microsoft. I'm the APAC Digital and Application Innovation Specialist from Microsoft. Um, I have over 15 years of experience in helping customers uh, really navigate their digital transformation journey. So I'm super passionate about understanding the, the business drivers and the problem statements they're trying to solve and then um, aligning those with technology and business solutions to help drive them forward. I'll pass over to Sangun from Nextport. Thank you, Brett. Uh, hi there, uh, this is Sagun here. Uh, uh, I've almost had uh, 13 plus years of experience uh, building and co-founding startups myself uh, as a founder CTO. I did it. Uh, and- uh, No. And uh, yeah, so uh, basically uh, my background uh, has helped me kind of uh, come through and uh, join podcast uh, in the last one and a half years to kind of uh, help build and scale uh, the uh, predictive supply chain platform. Uh, so at Podcast, what we do is we basically help you predict uh, 
just like Google Maps, uh, when is the cargo going to arrive uh, uh, at the port of destination uh, for different Fortune 500 customers? Uh, we have a very uh, sort of special case of machine learning where we our core product offering helps uh, uh, build predictions into the supply chains uh, with uh, uh, models that can actually handle the uh, ongoing disruptions at the sea. So be it cyclones, be it geopolitical tensions, like the one that you saw this year uh, that's happening across Russia and Ukraine, uh, or for that matter, last year where you kind of saw the Suez Canal issue. So uh, any disruptions that are ongoing uh, eventually lead to domino effects uh, on the maritime ocean tracking, and that uh, can delay the entire supply chain, uh, essentially delaying your iPhone delivery uh, uh, on the launch days being missed out. So we have basically these customers uh, end to end to help them predict and track uh, my background of coming completely new to the space, uh, not knowing anything about supply chain has not been a deterrent at all to be able to kind of come and build uh, for this space. Uh, so I encourage everyone to kind of uh, look at this uh, opportunity of building in this excellent uh, global supply chain space. Uh, I would like to kind of pass it on to Flores Wilming uh, from Onboard. Hello everybody, uh, joining from, um, from Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Um, actually, for 14 years already in the maritime industry, the idea for, for Onboard originated actually uh, when I was working in Singapore, working and living there. Uh, 2016, I came back, started Onboard. But it's good to be back in, in, uh, in Singapore, even though it's, uh, it's online. Would like to, more later, I would like to pass it on to, uh, to Edwin. Thank you. Thank you, Flores. And with the introductions out of the way, it's time for the presentations to start. Uh, as always, we're looking forward to your questions and comments. You can use the chat box for that. Uh, after two years of online conferencing, we're certain that you'll find your way to submit them and uh, we'll make sure that we address them at the Q&A section towards the end. So please do uh, do that. Um, Moving on then to our first speaker, which is uh, Mr. Ang Chengkiat from PSA International. Uh, we'll be waiting for his presentation to come online. And then, uh, Mr. Ang, the floor is yours. Thank you, Edwin. I'll just wait a while for the presentation slides. Okay, thank you. A very good afternoon to all. Uh, I, I will begin the session on this, uh, what we call the uh, API market uh, forces. And my title for this presentation is PSA API journey for the supply chain orchestration. The shipping and maritime industry has always been about connecting, enabling connectivity for the cargo flow. Not just in the physical sense, but also at its information layers. We continue to face challenges at a number of, uh, in a number of areas. I think first, increasing terminal automation, uh, automation and its monitoring of cargo at all levels. And this requires increasing real-time IoT information exchanges across different equipment with different operating standards. Second type of a challenge that the industry is still facing, shipping communities are driving initiative like trade land, GSBN, DS, uh, DCSA, to improve data exchanges over traditional means of EDI exchanges. The change management will not be easy, and the, globe, and the global terminal operator and the whole uh, what called supply chain ecosystem has to meet this market demand for the interoperability. I think the challenge that the industry will face, consumer and market expectation are also increasing for faster and better supply chain coordination. The demand for them is even greater and more real time and more August uh, Christian. Adding to these three business challenges, I think it's known to everybody, cybersecurity has also become an important topic with ongoing maritime digital transformations. Enabling information connectivity demand not just speed, but safety and resiliency across the uh, connected supply chain. The go-to technology for enabling this connectivity in the information layer in today's world is the API 
or what is known as application programming interface. APIs are essential to break down the silos of data, to connect the dot across our information supply chain to form an internet of logistics. How shall we then do it? Do this in a safe, organized, and sustainable way. The supply chain orchestration provides cargo visibility to the entire supply chain ecosystem from a practical and essential collaborative operational activities. Covering from a shipper to a consignee that include multi-modalities transport to partner supplier. PSA ourselves, we see this overall API interaction to, to classify into three layers and operating in uh, three areas to enable this internet of logistics to benefit the supply chain customers and for the greater efficiency for the maritime ecosystems. First layer is what we term as the terminal equipment that in, involve system APIs for all these IoT operations, allowing the multi-blend and bulk model to interact and reduce the risk of individual equipment uh, player dependencies. Most equipment stay accessible to the plug and operate models. The second layer is what we term as the operational layers. This involves the process APIs for the terminal operation or terminal for terminal operating uh, on the business processes. The business processes follow loosely coupled implementation with internal APIs as a crucial communication layers with the benefit of agility and flexibility to market demand, reduce the interdependency for horizontal and vertical functional accessibilities. Finally, the layer on the supply chain community to stay as a collaborative marketplace with connected top community strengthened by enterprise APIs, where the market players are connected for higher visibility on the sustainability-driven supply chain services. So this external API follow optimal reuse design from the existing internal API, which is crucial for the time to market. With the journey on the, uh, digitization, we have set PSA ourselves, we have set the standard to facilitate digitization with its community to a, what we know as PSA API marketplace. Okay. PSA, API, uh, PSA API marketplace follow, follow an industrial API implementation framework as shown in these slides. So that cover the implementation, governance, and securities. And this actually allowed the ease of a subscriber to stay connected with PSA uh, uh, processes and to the entire supply chain community. The API portal includes a safe and secure developer network environment for self-service consumption of PSA published as external APIs. The diagram here provides a conceptual view of the active implementation with a layering of the API components. The key highlight of this capability for the industry include reusability of APIs, promoting industry API standard implementation, increase the experience of developer and partner, usage of analytics to monitor technical and business behavior, and finally, the enforcing the security and access policy. With an established API marketplace, it becomes easier for applications to discover services, combine and create strategy synergies for better product offering. I think let me actually use this one case example to actually demonstrate on how API services are combined for a better ecosystem in the whole supply chain orchestration. One of the many things that maritime ports and terminals do is to provide hubbing services for consolidation and distribution of cargoes. Often, this is coordinated across many different stakeholders and their system. It is challenging and difficult to do at scale and speed when manual steps and 
multiple exchanges are involved. In PSA, we have similar forward hubbing services that allow dynamic and nimble distribution of cargo based on demand. An end-to-end -end solution implemented by PSA and its customer is enabled via API integration across the various application platforms. Here, shippers are able to use our digital platform called known as Calista to plan and move cargo inventory to staging location in Singapore, such as the district park. This planning is real-time integrated to the port community system known as the Singapore Portnet. And with the API integration with Calista and Portnet, this, the inventories are updated at near real time, transported and replenished at the right time. The port community state Portnet is in term API linked to the terminal for real-time operations execution and events are received from terminal to notify the whole community on the whole uh, real-time uh, visibility of the whole supply chain. These APIs integrated supply chain make it most resilient and is real-time man manner and able faster orchestration of the cargo flow. The results, the outcomes, inventory are staged nearer to market as required. Order can be shipped to a wider coverage of markets and provided a shorter lead time to the destination. The earlier case I have shared on how cargo can move faster through API and platform collaboration. Cargo are transported to Singapore early and through API and even coordination across different stakeholders cargo can now move faster to its destination when the need arises. This coordination we learn apply to maritime system development uh, as well. This can be realized through the benefit of co-development collaboration and also localization of the developer through this, what we call the developer network. The ability to collaborate activity remotely to develop digital application fast is in fact a very important factor for the whole supply chain orchestration. PSA began to develop the PSA developer network, a site that originally meant to serve the internal PSA uh, teams for fast remote application uh, development. As it happened, the PSA developer in overseas location also found the developer network and is API useful for remote development, collaboration, and customization. Very soon, we onboarded other IT partners in the whole supply chain for co-development, API-enabled application like the control tower terminal dashboard, driver mobile apps, and these benefits are realized faster in the whole application process. Today, PSA Developer Network is shipping out to be a single site for PSA and extended community to develop and discover more users of common APIs. To API enable development and coordination across various teams, we hope to deliver application faster when the need arrives. We look forward to continue to implement this global developer network and use the API for like-minded maritime developer committee to participate, co-develop, and enrich the supply chain capability. With that, I thank everybody. Have a great experience at the Singapore Maritime Week. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ang, for those insights. Uh, great to see PSA being such a front runner in both internal and external developments of the, the API uh, framework that, that you have. Now, we are rapidly moving on to the next speaker, which is uh, breast bedding of Microsoft. Take it away. Thank you very much. And it, it leads on quite well from uh, Mr. Ang's conversation as well in relation to speeding up the process of uh, releasing APIs to the market for, for my topic today. So in today's digital world, businesses are increasingly relying on APIs to deliver data and services. And when the creation and maintenance of APIs has become a major part of business strategy. So I'm really wanting to share some insights today on how we can leverage API ops um, for the end-to-end -end automation of the API lifecycle. So 
So a lot of us will be familiar with DevOps. So DevOps is describing a specific development process that relies upon continuous integration and delivery. And under DevOps, we're quickly pushing changes to a product down the product pipeline. And then the changes are rapidly tested and then automatically staged. An evolution of that is DevSecOps. So DevSecOps is really where we're taking a DevOps uh, mindset and then we're putting security first into that process. And by, by putting security into every phase of the development lifecycle from design to delivery. When implemented successfully, companies are uh, gaining both the speed of DevOps development processes with the holistic security and uh, peace of mind that comes with DevSecOps. So this is really helping organizations reduce remediation time by shifting security left, integrating with and securing the existing tool chains, and then also quickly identifying new security threat vectors. The larger role of APIs in the enterprise requires businesses to really intelligently plan their API development and management efforts. It's not really enough to simply create and release an API or adopt an outside API and just hope for the best. We're really after comprehensive API management strategies that are helping address the needs of developers, applications, users, and businesses in a comprehensive manner. API Ops is around applying the concept of GitOps and DevOps to API deployment. And by using the practices from these two methodologies, API Ops can enable everyone involved in the life cycle of API design, development, and deployment with a self-service and automated tools to ensure the quality and specifications of APIs that they're building. API Ops places the API, the Azure API management infrastructure under version control to achieve these goals. Rather than making code changes directly in API management, uh, most of the operations are now able to be held through code changes that can be reviewed and audited similar to a software change set. As with all software, APIs are iterative. Uh, these lifecycle steps may repeat countless times throughout the life of an API. API development and tests might repeat many, many times before a single version is accepted for release. APIs have two acute requirements that software products might lack, and that's obviously having backward compatibility and strong documentation. Both of these factors should figure prominently in any API strategy and lifecycle. In the planning and design phase, an organization discusses its technical and business needs it formalizes the fundamental requirements for the API. It approves the design specifications and documentation. Common API design best practices, including outlining uh, the API language, naming standards, layouts, messaging, and also architecture. The open API specification defines a standard language agnostic interface for the RESTful APIs, which allows both humans and computers to discover and understand the capabilities of the service without access to the source code documentation or through network traffic inspection. When properly defined, a consumer can understand and interact with the remote service with a minimal amount of implementation logic. An open API definition can then be used by document generation tools to display the API or code generation tools to generate the servers and clients in various programming languages. Um, it can be used by testing tools and many other use cases. When developers are coding the API using everyday development tools and programming languages such as Python, C Sharp, Java, Rust, and many others, they can also leverage a variety of IDEs such as VS Code. Once a version of the API is approved for deployment, the development team must understand how the API will be deployed to the data center or released for outside consumption to business partners and other users. This includes the use of public or private repositories. Validating an API for reliability, security, and performance is a central part of any API strategy. With an API testing environment often linking to other tools within the developer tool chain and supporting multiple test types, you might be familiar with functional testing to validate the API's functions, security and error handling. You might have performance testing to gauge how well the API handles workloads under stress and variable traffic conditions. And acceptance testing to check the user's ability to employ and utilize the API for its intended purposes. API analytics and monitoring is really around the API engine collecting and, and analyzing the metrics related to the API's use, and then producing reports for the API developers and stakeholders. API metrics might include the number of calls or the users making the calls, uh, latency, uptime and availability, CPU me memory utilization, or errors and trends over time. 
Azure API management is really allowing organizations to publish APIs hosted on Azure on-premise and in other clouds more securely, reliably, and at scale. Using API management to drive the consumption among internal teams, partners, and developers while benefiting from the business and log analytics available in the admin portal. This service helps provide the tools your organization needs for the end-to-end -end API management from everything from provisioning user roles, creating usage plans and quotas, applying policies for, for transforming payloads, throttling, analytics, monitoring, and alerts. Diving a bit deeper into the, the CICD aspect of API ops workflow, one possible workflow could look like the API developers designing, creating, and testing the open APIs, and then committing them inside the, the Git repository or Git repo. You might then have an automated pipeline deploying it automatically and staging it in a test environment, which would then trigger a test plan and a load test. And after the test is successful, you could create a pull request. You could gate that for reviewing changes and any, any pull request approvals, which might be manual or automatic. And then that, the PR is gonna merge and trigger an automatic pipeline to deploy into the production environment. The publisher pipeline is gonna then update the Azure APIM instance with artifact folder contents. And the, the extractor is generating the API ops artifacts from an existing APIM instance. These artifacts can then be used as a source of truth for your APIM environment, making changes to them and having the CICD process update your Azure environment. So it's really around creating that circular reference and that, that um, updated state of play for it all. One of the aspects that I've not really gone into detail about is really the consumption of APIs. Um, and to uh, Mr. Ung's point, it's, it's a bit sitting outside of this process, but it's critical to your enterprise API strategy. The consumption of APIs is, is generally achieved through an API development portal, where having well-documented APIs allows for different organizations to easily see what's available and also guide them on how to consume it. Generally containing a change log to show the evolution over time of the API, or perhaps if the API is reaching the end of life or is no longer being supported. Um, if you have access to the Azure portal with an active Azure subscription, feel free to dive a bit deeper into the, the whole Azure API ops methodology and try this hands-on lab. With GitHub and Azure, it's really never been easier to kickstart and scale your own API ops practice with, it, with our unified solution. And the complete tool set is really allowing you to bridge the divide of how you're building software and APIs internally within your organizations, helping you to secure your development environments and really embed security into your API developer workflow. Embracing API ops is, is a software delivery advantage. Um, it's gonna help remove the bottlenecks clogging your delivery pipelines, provide the necessary controls for compliance and security by uncovering the vulnerabilities earlier. And your teams are saving time remediating, remediating any of those issues and realizing compliancy while also minimizing any associated costs. It allows you to return to what's important of propelling the innovation with effective and secure software delivery. Uh, today's innovative enterprises are adopting API architectures to really accelerate their growth. They're streamlining their work across the hybrid and multi-cloud environments with a single place to manage all of your APIs. So it's really around moving faster with a unified API management solution. Uh, thank you all for your time today and, and please feel free to reach out and, and engage in us with any questions that you might have today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brett, for this very technical deep dive into the capabilities and benefits of API measurements using uh, Microsoft Azure. Uh, the next speaker will be much less technical, uh, namely myself, although I will be showcasing an example of a platform built on Microsoft Azure. So that's a nice uh, little link. I see my presentation shows up on the screen. So, so yeah, yeah, let's let's go. My presentation will have two elements. First, I will share how Nextport helped transforming the port of Antwerp in one of the most digitally connected ports in the world. And then I'll show how a coalition of the willing uh, successfully created a community on the Nextport platform to rapidly attack problem statements from the industry. The Nextport was founded back in 2016 in Antwerp when the port community decided to embrace new technology to overcome their supply chain challenges. Back then, the next big thing was named Brexit. We haven't heard of COVID or, uh, or, or sustainability yet. Uh, and there were a number of studies that indicated that 
the port lost over a billion euros per annum due to inefficiencies in processes or poor planning. So the idea and the goal was to create visibility and thus efficiency in the supply chain by using a secure API first data sharing platform that connect the entire ecosystem, both public and private. Now, a few key design principles, key requirements that we received at the beginning were the fact that we were to ensure strict separation of the data sharing capabilities of the platform and the marketplaces that reside on top of it where APIs and apps can be monetized. The second was to offer a low entry barrier, both technically and financially, enabling all to join and catering for all the different levels of digital maturity in, in, in the port. And finally, and probably most importantly, we had to ensure that data providers remain in full control of their data, with whom they share it, under which conditions, and whether they do that for free or they monetize this. How does it look conceptually? A free a free cake layer, if you may, with the data sharing backbone in place, all the port stakeholders were now in, in uh, sorry, all the port stakeholders being the terminal operators, the ocean liners, shipping agent, but also public players like customs and immigrations were able to connect digitally to all their relevant parties with a single connection through the Nextport platform. And that eliminated the need for them to establish this single individual connection with each and every one of them. Without having time to, to, to present too much technical detail, the platform offers a variety of, of services, as you can imagine, secure identity access management, the ability for data users and data providers to make digital handshakes on the platform, agreeing on the terms of data sharing, and the ability of the platform to ingest multiple data formats uh, to, to convert those into generic APIs that can be shared easily across the chain. And in some use cases, data providers may want to store their data on, in their secure data vaults, which we provide on the platform. So with these capabilities in place, the first APIs were soon being built and data started flowing across the network. For example, container import consignment data was sent from the ocean liners to customs and then was subsequently shared, uh, harmonized and shared with the agents and forwarders in the port for their respective processes. And that gave a lot of productivity gains as it was cutting down their administrative times. And it was improving uh, tremendously the compliance with local customs regulations. Uh, it were use cases like this that very rapidly demonstrated that this, uh, this effective point-to-point -point API connectivity between those players was, was giving productivity gains and, and efficiency. And, and that's when this fun really started. So communities, should I say, coalitions of the willing were forming on the platform with industry front runners and application builders coming together to build solutions for real problem statements in the port of Antwerp. And I'll share one of those examples a bit later in my presentations around eClick. Now, over the years, across all verticals, in the container business, liquid bulk, dry bulk, great bulk, a number of APIs and apps were created and became available through the marketplaces on the platform. We also saw third-party app builders and API vendors found, finding our platform useful because it gave them a marketing outlet through which they could rapidly onboard new customers in markets where they were not really active. And it was uh, allowing them to offer pay-per-use models uh, uh, to, to their customers without having to build and maintain these capabilities by themselves. Today, Nextport offers a mature data utility platform in one of the world's leading seaports. Uh, we have security in our DNA. That's why we're proud to be recognized as critical digital infrastructure under the EU NIS directive, which is EU-wide legislation on cybersecurity. Um, and with over 50 maritime and port APIs and apps in our stores, we have been uh, providing value in a variety of domains. Plus, we made it sticky. 
because by now over 3,000 parties across Europe and the UK have been subscribing to one or more uh, services on the Nextport platform, and you see a small uh, subset of that uh, of that uh, base uh, visualized here. Now, by popular demand, uh, last year in 2021, Nextport International was established with offices in Antwerp, Houston, and here in Singapore. Uh, with the aim to bring the success of the platform to the wider world. Now let's shift gears here and talk about one of the communities that were successfully uh, formed on the platform and powered by Nextport, eClick. eClick stands for the European Chemical Logistics Information Council and was formed in 2018 by three leading industry associations in which companies are represented from the chemical industry, uh, the chemical transport uh, market and the uh, tank cleaning industry. Now inspired by the uh, capabilities Nextport had to offer, eClick aims to fully digitize the European chemical supply chain which until today, I can promise you, maintains a fanatical devotion to uh, paper and rubber stamps. Now, the first use case that the first problem statement that eClick attacked was the digitization of the cleaning certificates for chemical tanks, the so-called ECD document. Now, a bit of context for those who are not too familiar. Um, when in Antwerp, uh, just checking my slides, yeah, when in Antwerp, the, the uh, uh, chemicals are produced, they're often shipped to the, shipped to the U EU hinterland using road tankers. Now, before a uh, tanker can be loaded, the transport company obviously needs to ensure that the previous load is compatible with the products to be shipped. Um, and if that's not the case, the tanker will be sent for professional cleaning. Now, this particular uh, uh, company that cleans the, the tanker will issue a so-called cleaning certificate or the ECD. This paper document, and as you can imagine, which is, uh, comprises of many, many carbon copies, finds its way throughout the entire process, uh, physically moved to the uh, seller of the product, the transport company, the uh, loading terminal, and eventually to the buyer. And with more than 4 million of those documents being processed annually, you can imagine that's an easy target for digitization. And that's exactly what happened. So we had front runners from the eClick e community, parties from the chemical industry, transport and, and tank cleaning. They worked together with two application and API builders, Nalian and uh, uh, Pioneer to build uh, or basically to, to uh, digitize that entire workflow into a simple app, which was then hosted on the Nextport platform. So now the stakeholders in this process, the seller, the transporter, the cleaning company, the loading terminal, they all have direct secure access to the application using the Nextport platform. They're able to share data from their ERP systems or ingest from the applications into their system, knowing that the data will not be stored externally for prolonged periods of time or cannot be used for analytics purposes. Um, and that made quite a, a positive impact on this, on this particular uh, supply chain. Currently, over 50 companies and 750 users are using this particular application and hopefully not hampered with COVID anymore in the next three years, eClicks aims to uh, to, to bring that up to 600 companies using uh, the uh, electronic ECD module to reach its full potential. And to briefly summarize, there's a variety of, of, of benefits that, uh, that this uh, has, not only saving tens of millions of sheets of paper per annum eventually, but also, and that's uh, one of the key uh, benefits, is the reduction of chemical contamination in this kind of processes because paperwork is missing. Uh, obviously, paperless processes not only bring the productivity gains that everybody knows about, but it also gives useful digital audit trails, which helps fraud detection and problems in that space. Uh, the transport companies benefit tremendously from it because 
they have real-time visibility on the status of their equipment and where that equipment is so they can optimize their planning, which is a, a, an upside to their revenue. And on the other hand, you see throughout the chain different uh, parties uh, enjoying reduced waiting times, so it's, it's lowering their OPEX. So you can imagine across the chain that gives higher customer loyalty uh, uh, to, to, to all. And finally, I think that is uh, the more exciting one from a technical point of view. It really accelerates the further digitization of the supply chain. Since the first ECD documents went live on the platform, a further free documents were already added to that suite, and that uh, will only improve and, and uh, increase in the, in the time to come. So for me, that is a, a great example to, uh, of, a, of a tripartite uh, between industry players with problem statements, technology uh, providers, and a platform that will be allowing to uh, securely data, uh, exchange data. Um, with that, I would like to end my presentation. If you're excited about what Nextport can do for you as a port community or an app or API builder, uh, please do find uh, uh, me on LinkedIn and uh, uh, link up for, for further discussions, happy to support. Changing to my moderator role, I'd like to thank myself for this wonderful presentation. Uh, as we move on to the, uh, to the next speaker, which will be Sagun Garg from uh, Podcast, which will undoubtedly also give a wonderful presentation. Over to you, Sagun. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Edwin. That was pretty insightful. Uh in terms of the stakeholder orchestration at the port level uh, in terms of data sharing. Uh, so for me, I think uh, what I'm going to try and do is excite your people as an entrepreneur founder to kind of see uh, how you could potentially take these insights back home today to be able to kind of build something uh, in the API space for the predictive supply chains or maybe able to even use an existing API that is available in the API marketplaces like Mr. Ang highlighted for PSA. So uh, for me, the title is going to be very uh, simple that uh, how do you as a developer decide in the next 10 minutes with me, uh, what offering uh, to build in the maritime predictive supply chain space. So I will try and give you a mental model uh, in terms of how you should look at the various APIs uh, that are available or the data that is getting generated in this space and how do you really leverage that? So I'll try and give you a mental model here to think about this uh, sort of half a third availability of so many APIs. Uh, you can take a very simple analogy. Uh, I think on the left-hand side, I know it looks like a too big complicated diagram, don't worry. Uh, just look at the first column. It says uh, the, the current space uh, around how we see the crypto space. I think some of you, if they are interested in crypto, it, there's an analogy that says about the layers of the crypto space now mimics the internet stack. So similarly, in the middle, you see the internet stack where you have different layers. So you talk about the physical layer, the network layer, uh, the transport layer, and then the application layer. In a very similar analogy, I would like to kind of give an opinion that uh, the supply chain space should also be looked at in a very similar uh, stacked manner. So the data gets generated at various layers and you eventually can decide how do you want to kind of play at what layer. So either you're talking about the inland terminals or the warehouses, you're talking about the seaports, uh, then there are vessels that are operating at each of these seaports. Uh, then there are containers that are traveling on multiple vessels, just like a connecting bus where as a passenger, you would kind of switch uh, between two uh, a bus stop to match two buses. So similarly, a container also travels on multiple vessels, hops over those multiple vessels to eventually reach its port of destination. Or it could be at the goods level where uh, the goods are traveling in each of those containers and how they stack up. So one big takeaway from each of my slides uh, is what I wanted to take away today. And from this slide, I wanted to think in terms of layers uh, that will help you simplify the whole idea, which API to use for what problem statement and which API to consume uh, from a given API that is available. Because supply chain is all about stakeholder participation, uh, partnerships, orchestration, and each stakeholder at different layers is operating and generating data and consuming the data from the below layer. So uh, 
I will move on to the next slide to kind of give you some insights. So what I've tried, tried to do here is kind of give you some insights into what kind of data that gets generated. So if you look at the terminal warehouse levels, you are looking at problem statements that are all around planning uh, around the ports in terms of the birthing times of the vessels when they're arriving or when they're departing from uh, the uh, ports. Uh, this generally is handled by the port operators uh, like PSA, uh, and uh, they basically understand the data in real time in terms of when the vessels would be coming in and arriving at the ports. Then there is this whole piece around intermodal. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Edwin touched a little bit about that, where he was trying to highlight that uh, there are data sharing agreements between stakeholders. So when you receive a container at the port level, it basically has to then go on to the truck, which will further carry away uh, that same container. So there is a whole intermodal of sea to land, which can be rail or it can be the trucks. So what I'm trying to basically highlight here is that at different layers of the stack, there is different data that's getting generated uh, and that there is different stakeholders who are managing that, that data. So it all boils down to at what layer, which API are you trying to build? Are you trying to build an API at the terminals or the warehouse layer, which then can be further be useful to the ports? Are you trying to build an API layer at the ports level, which something like PSA can do because they operate so many ports globally, right? Uh, where they have data sharing agreements as well with other ports. So then, how do you really craft a, a value proposition uh, in terms of uh, the highest buck that you can generate for a stakeholder in the market in terms of market sizing at then what layer? Obviously, everybody wants to operate at the topmost application layer, given the underlying guarantees of the container layer vessels or ports and terminals. But then uh, eventually it all boils down to how good the quality of the data is. So. Uh, I mean, we are, in a, we are already in a century where machine learning and uh, uh, AI is kind of taking uh, over all the interesting applications in terms of, uh, you know, really figuring out uh, what the humans can't uh, uh, at a pattern level. And hence, data has become the new oil. So it's really important to understand at what layer are you going to consume an API and at what layer are you going to sell this API eventually for. And I think that's super important to be able to no upstart rather than trying to just go ahead and uh, you know build. So I'll just move on to the next one. So uh, I, I'm taking a leaf out of what Podcast did. So Podcast is basically, uh, in simple terms, uh, Google Maps for cargo. Uh, we also thought about the same problem statement the way I just shared it to you in the previous slide. And for us, uh, it has been uh, the simplest analogy that we can take is uh, when you kind of go to watch a movie uh, at a movie theater, uh, and your movie is scheduled to be at 8 p.m. You're continuously checking your mobile phone for Google Maps to check the predictions of your time of arrival when you're in your Uber or your Grab car. And you're just trying to communicate with your loved one who's waiting for you at the movie theater. At what time will you arrive? That is so important because you're not going to miss the movie on at 8 p.m. or you're going to be late by 10 minutes at 8.10 or maybe you'll arrive early. And that whole makes the difference in terms of the ramifications uh, for me, if my wife is waiting, she wouldn't really appreciate if I'm 10 minutes late. So uh, you can understand the implications. It's, it's a very similar challenge when it comes to supply chains, uh, the delay in the supply chain. So when the sea, at the sea, when the vessel is carrying the container where your goods are traveling, uh, cyclones, geopolitical tensions, uh, uh, delays because your cargo fell off the uh, sort of vessel. These are all real things that happen just like uh, traffic congestion when you see in the land. And they all have to be factored in into your data stack when you're trying to build for a problem statement like predictions of a container arriving at a port of destination. So I'll just quickly walk you over what layers we kind of think through when we kind of build. So the layer one is the most elemental layer of developing a Python uh, uh, framework, an API framework to use an API framework. You could also use Azure, like how, how I kind of, uh, you know, Brett uh, talked about it to do your POCs and then kind of see how it works out for you. So at layer when you would basically publish your APIs, but then the interesting part starts where, you know, you have to build, basically build these data pipelines to ingest data. So you're not going to track all of the data. Uh, uh, you could have your own proprietary data that you're generating if you would do your own devices and IoT device. Uh, I think uh, 
uh, Floris will talk about that a little later on in his next presentation, how they do for vessel, vessels. But essentially, if you're not having any of your own data, you're basically going to do a lot of partnerships, a lot of vendors. And you're going to ingest all of this data. So this data then has to come. This is event. Let me highlight to you how this data is peculiar. It's uh, eventful streaming data. Uh, it's event-driven data. It continuously streams because these are timestamps uh, that are getting generated uh, and they have a geospatial connotation to it because your containers are traveling live. So imagine having lat longs continuously being generated with different timestamps. That's the layer three that you would want to then want to kind of prepare yourself with uh, in terms of your tech stack. And then layer four comes around handling big data because you're talk talking about millions of containers, you're talking millions of products traveling in the supply chain. And if you're building a problem statement around that space at the fourth or the fifth layer that I've talked about in the previous slide. So this slide, the top two layers are the containers and the goods. You're talking about millions of containers traveling, carrying your cargo, carrying your iPhone uh, to be delivered at the right time. And then there are interesting problems like uh, you, what you could build for like hedge funds, uh, trying to really take into your alternative information data as to how does the supply forecasting look like uh, and then being able to predict in the markets around certain commodities. So there are some interesting problem use cases that you could build around that. Uh, uh, and then that means ingesting millions of data points and being able to tackle them on an hourly basis or, or a daily basis in your system. So then you have to have a big data layer on top. And then obviously the, the mother of all in terms of innovation comes is the MLAI layer, where you're generating and using the machine learning on top of all of these layers to be able to really craft a problem statement that is really useful uh, in terms of uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning. So uh, let me quickly take one example, just kind of highlight to you. So uh, the two black dots with a thread connected in between is nothing but the source port and the destination port. And the blue line is basically the trajectory of that particular vessel. Uh, and, the, and the basically anchors that you're seeing are ports in between uh, that the vessel is crossing. So you could essentially take one example where you would want to keep your machine learning to have really updated real-time data. And to be able to do that, you would do a combination of satellite data, which is basically the uh, lat-long information, the, the geospatial location, live location, just like how uh, Google Maps would give you. And then you would combine it with something like port calls, which is basically a historically visited ports that have been completed in the journey. So imagine three bus stops have been completed. Let, them, let us call them as port calls. And the next four ports that are about to be coming in part of your schedule, uh, let's call them as your uh, schedule from the carrier. So you combine these three to be able to craft and uh, input layer data that you could then potentially use into your machine learning model to predict the use case uh, and what time will your container arrive at the port of destination, which is the second black dot. The challenge becomes, uh, which is the data quality in the industry, uh, a lot of carriers have different schedules. Uh, that's what we see when we work with them. There is no single reality. Uh, and that's why I've drawn two threads there, or a blue and a green. And your models, when they start working, they, they basically tackle different uh, kind of uh, schedules and port calls. And then that's where the real fun begins uh, in terms of how well are you stacked up in terms of technological capability. Uh, and that really decides, uh, uh, it becomes a parallel universe problem because you're dealing with you're reconstructing the journey that's spanning out, not in front of your eyes, but you're sitting in your office and building something for this. So it's a really interesting how you can potentially uh, problem solve here. Uh, following to that, uh, so, so I just want to kind of highlight uh, one takeaway from each slide that I kind of mentioned. So the first one that I just wanted to say was uh, here, think of this in terms of a mental model of creating layers Always think of layers. That's the only takeaway. Forget the complexity in this slide, right? The second one is in these layers, what is the value proposition and what is the available data? How many are your competitors? Look at them. Uh, try and understand which ones will you be able to use inside your business and how many which you will be able to sell at what layer. So uh, it's about downstream, upstream. What part of the value chain do you want to be? What part of the market sizing are you really going after? Uh, in terms of your own ability to craft your own problem statement, layer the problem statement in terms of the technical challenges. Uh, understand the difference between how a big data layer is different from a data pipeline is different from, uh, you know, really understanding geospatial and time series data. 
versus event driven data how do you really layer them how do you adopt the right kind of technologies uh, to be able to do them uh, just building some sample code in python is just layer one you need to think still think through all of those layers in terms of crafting and then obviously a one problem statement uh, be real draw it out leave out the complexity uh, take three APIs, combine them, try and see what value are you really generating in terms of the use case against the problem that you're trying to fight. So those are my one one takeaways for each of those slides. And finally, uh, I have kind of some some interesting use cases at the top right corner of the slide where I'm trying to highlight port congestion is something serious in the last two years we've seen where vessels are waiting and anchoring. Uh, your goods are there at the port, but they're not really there. They're not getting offloaded from the vessels onto the port because there's a huge congestion problem. Uh, so th that's an interesting problem to see. How can you incorporate port congestion as a way to improve your predictions further? Uh, overall delay of shipments uh, in spite of you know uh, not having a global event, there are still inefficiencies in the system which can result into delay of uh, shipments. And then the global supply chain disruptions uh, advanced track and trace and vessel tracking. I think vessel tracking is going to be super interesting with Flores. He's going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, I hope uh, he's able to share insights more on that one. So yeah, I think uh, uh, we at podcast uh, are uh, working with very interesting problem statements. Uh, and uh, I come from a non-supply chain background myself. In one and a half years, I've sort of been able to kind of really problem solve. It's all about thinking first from first principles, trying to solve on a problem. Uh, and I really encourage you to kind of build on these use cases, think with this mental model. Uh, yeah, it's an opinionated, uh, nothing is absolute, but I just leave it up to you. How do you want to consume this? Uh, that'll be it from my side. Uh, yeah, podcast is hiring, come go, uh, let us know. And uh, I will pass it on to Flores, yeah. Thank you, Sagun. I think in, uh, in view of time, we rapidly move to, uh, to Flores. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you uh, uh, for the introduction, and Sagun also for your mental model. I hope we have an interesting uh, 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 layer to add to your, uh, to your model, right? So, um, uh, but first of all, a big thank you to Maritime and Port Authorities of Singapore for organizing this event, but also putting the API on, uh, on the agenda. It's not exactly uh, a, a new technology, but we believe it really is critical for the maritime industry. A critical technology for the maritime industry. And I will try to start with explaining why. So ever, I, ever since I joined the maritime industry, <clears throat> I have been very surprised about the, 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 uh, the slow adoption of information technology. Uh, before starting on board, I worked for an integrated shipbuilding company. And my first project there, this was in 2008, was to build a big data logger 14 years ago. So looking back now, I, I believe a great, uh, a great uh, uh, vision, great idea, but commercially never a success. And I've always kept on wondering, how is it possible that the maritime industry is not using information technology to its full potential? Because they're not using it, missing out on the opportunities it presents. And that for an industry that so clearly needs it. So, but coming from the shipbuilding side of the maritime industry, we understand really well the challenges for system integration on board of vessels. Uh, and this is because not a single vessel in the world is the same. Even if it looks the same on the outside, on the inside, it's not. It's always a unique combination of machine systems and sensors and no standard data infrastructure to connect them, uh, very immature networking infrastructures, uh, very limited internet connectivity. So basically what we have is our vessels are the biggest possible silos you can think of, literally, isolated islands of data. So from the start of on board, it has been our mission to create this, to break this silo, to make it easy to connect vessels, to uh, use vessel data and to share and, 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 and this infrastructure and data. Because even today, eh, if you have uh, uh, vessel centered applications, uh, you would like to use every time you need to implement a separate infrastructure, creating even more silos. Um, so therefore, this is actually, from our perspective, the biggest reason for collaboration, sharing this data infrastructure. Um, and, when we sh and when we collaborate, we can accelerate innovation, uh, we can create multiples of value, we can create better value. And we have to also be critical of our own work, we believe. The industry needs better solution uh, to accelerate the adoption of information technology. So how do we make it easy to connect um, uh, vessels? 
Well, we have uh, created a maritime IoT uh, gateway um, hardware and software that is able to communicate with nearly every machine system and sensor on board of the vessel. But this is only half of the data silo. The other half is the crew. And this is often forgotten. There's a lot of information with the crew. So how do we connect the crew? We connect the crew by running applications on the edge. Together with the infrastructure, we have developed uh, three uh, applications. And for today's sessions, uh, session, I will not go into the details of these uh, applications nor the benefits, because this event is not about the benefits we provide with this data and infrastructure. It's about the benefits you can create using this data. So what data is available? Yeah, the, the course concept. And also in a minute, I'm going to explain how you can find, find out exactly all the information that, is, that Onboard can provide you with. Um, so what we basically do is we collect all this machine data on board of the vessel. And we have these apps that can be used by the crew. For instance, the digital logbook that allows the crew to um, uh, register its voyages and activities. And the app provides a lot of flexibility to add details to both. So we have the machine data and the app data. And basically what it allows us to do is to add context to all this machine data by using this app data. Uh, so what we have now is we know exactly, for instance, what vessel X is using right now at this moment, but also during the, its current activity, its current voyage, and not only of vessel X, but of the whole fleet for the whole week, month, year, uh, divided over all, uh, all activities. So basically what we have is we have this really rich uh, combined and aggregated data set. So when we started looking on how to make it as easy as possible for partners uh, to use this data, uh, the GraphQL uh, standard uh, turned out to be a very natural fit. And what this means, adopting the GraphQL standard for, uh, for, uh, for onboard, it means that all of this information just described is available uh, in one single endpoint. Now, and all in a, in, a, in a format that for both humans and machines is understandable. And everybody with a little bit of training can learn. So if you think uh, you can work with this rich kind of vessel data, please go to our website, go to the vessel API page. There you can ex uh, access uh, our vessel API of the demo environment to see exactly uh, all the data that is available and all the queries you can make. Um, and this is, I forgot to mention that all of this is possible uh, because uh, the, 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 the schema uh, is, 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 is the basis of your GraphQL uh, API. And uh, because of this schema, the GraphQL API has uh, self-documenting uh, self um, um, capabilities. So uh, yet again, please log into our uh, API everything you need to know is, uh, is available there. There are many other benefits to the, uh, to the GraphQL uh, standard uh, that I will not discuss here today. But one important one is that it also allows us to continue to iterate, to add new data sources, new registrations, types and fields to the schema uh, without uh, breaking existing queries or, um, um, or, uh, or integrations. So actually, yeah, because of this infrastructure and data and applications and the API, the whole combination, uh, that is why we call it the Vessel API. And actually, we believe that this is how we are going to uh, uh, communicate in the future with our vessels via APIs. And the Vessel API is our implementation of that idea. So now, finally, let's look at some uh, existing use cases of uh, uh, the our Vessel API being used and some use cases that are being under development. So first of all, planning and billing. One of our clients, Boluda, one of the biggest uh, tech uh, operators in the world has integrated their ERP system and specifically that planning tool with on board. So they plan all the vessel voyages in their own tool. It's, this is sent to on board. We send it to the vessel where the captain receives all his scheduled voyages. He can accept them. He can register them and all this operational data goes back to the ERP system. And that can be used, for instance, for automatic invoice generation. Uh, supply, supply chain visibility, of course, mentioned today already a couple of times. Uh, one of our clients, a charter and their affiliated uh, uh, software provider, uh, Streamba, 
uh, they provide supply chain visibility solution for the maritime or for the offshore um, uh, offshore industry, uh, and they are uh, using uh, vessel uh, operational data uh, such as uh, available uh, deck space, uh, vessel activity, location, ETA stuff like that. Vessel performance. Uh, well, uh, Shell has integrated on board with their uh, fleet performance tool based on uh, uh, Microsoft Power BI. Uh, they use to receive every two weeks a set of daily progress reports that they imported. Now they have integrated uh, their uh, fleet performance solution with on board. So they're pulling all this data now real, uh, in, uh, in uh, real time. Uh, business intelligence. This is a, a development we are working on right now with clients and partners. Of course, it's been made very clear also during the many presentations today, it doesn't stop with the data of your vessels and of your fleets. When you move up the value chain, you wanna integrate this data uh, further. So we're looking into uh, integrating onboard with different business intelligence tools. Emission reporting, uh, basically we have all the information uh, available that is required for uh, emission reporting for the rules and regulations that are currently in place, but also the upcoming ones. We wanna make it easy to pull all of this data from, uh, from the API um, uh, for clients, but also uh, easy for verifiers to uh, access and process. Condition monitoring, this is one of our latest products we, we have released, vibration measurement on board of your vessel. Uh, as soon as you connect these sensors, this data is also available via the API. Uh, and we are excited to explore the use cases that are possible uh, based on this technology. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your uh, time. Uh, please um, uh, reach out if you think you can work with this, um, uh, with this rich vessel data. Um, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Back to Edwin. Thank you, Floris. And that uh, concludes our presentations for today. I see the, uh, the next speakers are already anxiously awaiting to, uh, to, to get going. So I'm not certain whether we have time for, for the Q and A's. There's a couple of questions in the pigeonhole. Um, uh, we heard just to recap PSA talking about how they uh, manage their internal foundation uh, to create external APIs, uh, showcasing some of their cargo solutions and their active engagements with, uh, with developers. We've heard from uh, Brett at Microsoft, uh, who took a deep dive into the capabilities and the benefits of API management on Microsoft Azure. Uh, then we heard of Nextport, uh, who demonstrated that a data sharing platform and an API marketplace is actually a reality nowadays, and it's not a dream far, far away. And subsequently, we had podcasts where Sagun gave a very insightful mind mapping of the developers' challenges and breaking that down in technology, the tech stack layers, uh, identifying value propositions and, and data requirements, very insightful. And finally, we had Flores from the Netherlands dialing in, sharing a few examples of how digitizations and making vessel data APIable really helps uh, their customers today. Thanks for that uh, sharing. Again, I'm looking at uh, Enrique, maybe you want to share. Do we have time to, to Q&A or are we moving to the next uh, presenters? It seems you have five minutes by the clock, but I mean, it's up to you. You want to address those questions in five minutes. Obviously, since they're raised, I'll take that five minutes. So I'm having a look at the, uh, uh, at the questions now. There's five of them. I'll just randomly go uh, through them. Uh, the first one is for onboard, Mr. Flores. How to transmit data to and from vessels who are running in the ocean? By what type of communication? Uh, is there expensive satellite comms or others? Question mark. Flores. Yeah, so we are always using whatever is available on uh, on on the vessel itself. So the existing uh, uh, internet connectivity you, uh, you can use. Of course, the the the, the amount of data uh, that is transferred is depending on 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 the data sources you connect. Um, in basic situation, it's 100 MBs uh, a day. Thank you. Moving on to the next one for Sagun. What would a data pipelines that ingest data in a data streaming fashion look like instead of data pulling from APIs? Sure. I think uh, there are two sets of APIs. One is the pull API and one is the push APIs. The pull APIs is technically the 
standard RESTful APIs that we are used to using. The push API is the webhooks paradigm. We see some of the vendors in the market uh, and other partners to also be working with push APIs, uh, which essentially means setting up webhooks, a capability to consume. So that's interesting. Uh, another use case where you can build your APIs like webhooks. Thanks. Then going to the first question that came in, what are API metrics that should be made known to API consumers by API developers other than rates, limits, expected latency, et cetera, so we can ensure smooth and consistent data flow across platforms? Maybe that's one I want to post to, uh, to Brett. It's a very, very interesting question. Um, I guess it comes down to the, the type of information that we're really collecting from the APIs themselves as to what's beneficial to the API developers consuming them. Um, essentially, you know, as a developer, you're the owner of that API and then you have the consumer. So I guess trying to make sure that uh, your availability, your security of your API is first and foremost. And whether you expose that or not is a different different side of the equation because it's it's your um brand i guess it's, it's your reputation that's driving that api consumption so um the onus is really on the producer as opposed to the consumer um but at the same time because you don't want to you don't want the api payload to be excessively heavy either so it's about making sure we're sending the appropriate data for the consumption of that api um, and then whatever that api is doing for the business Thank you very much. And that gives us a minute to go to the last question. I think, that, and that's the bread and butter of uh, Mr. Ang on uh, on security. How susceptible is accessibility of the data to cyber hacking and what mitigating measures can be put in place to guard against cyber attacks? Thanks, Elvin, and thanks uh, for the, asking the questions. Uh, I would say that I think for data, it's the same as any internet-facing application. The attack surface, as you expose more of it, will become bigger. So yes, it's susceptible. Mitigating, actually, I can just list a few as a kind of a what called best practice. Okay, you first must really aware and understand your own data. Okay, whether you have hundred, you have better inventorize and then manage your APIs. And after having that, we must have a strong authentication and authorizing solution. And using the simple cybersecurity rule, practice the principle of least privilege and only expose what is needed and not more than is necessary. Example, please do not include password and all these things that is included in the APIs. Okay, and uh, basically encrypt your traffic. I, I believe that will actually are uh, those uh, best practice of mitigating action that we should put in place as we expose our APIs. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I think with that, we come to the end of the Q&A session. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today for their insights. And uh, Enrique, back to you. Thank you, Edwin and the panelists. Uh, very interesting session about the APIs and exciting applications.